welcome back to first, the first annual Taxation is Stuff Fest. I am your host, Dre, from Drunken Disorderly Media, and I am learning so much today about so much stuff, especially uh, alternative medicine. And today, um, we have learned a lot so far from the folks we've had on, from uh, Andy Melder. He was great. I'm going to have him on my show so I can learn some more. We did not have enough time for him. But help me welcome Dr. Mary Ruart. Uh, Mary Ruart is a PhD libertarian research scientist scientist and ethicist. She currently chairs Liberty International and is the author of best-selling International, Healing Our World, The Compassion of Libertarianism, Short Answers to the Tough Questions, and Death by Regulation. And Mary is here to talk to us today about death by regulation. Well, hi, Doreen. Hi, everyone. Hello. It's nice to see you again. Yes, it is. It is. It's good to be here. I'm going to get right to it because I have so much to share. So basically, what I'm going to talk to you about today is <laughs> Death by Regulation, uh, which is the title of my latest book. And I'm going to explain why and how the FDA has taken five to ten years off each of our lives. And uh, the second thing I'm going to talk about, if that wasn't horrible enough, is how the FDA has really made it very difficult for us to get through the coronavirus and possibly has caused more deaths than we otherwise would have had. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about how this happened. Um, in 1962, the Kefauver Harris Amendments to the Food and Drug Act were passed. It gave the FDA so much power over pharmaceutical development, it's almost unlimited because these amendments were open-ended, so they increase every year. And because of that, every year there's more and more regulation, not just in the drug industry, but in medical practice and in the supplement industry, because the FDA has extended its reach into these areas because of the way the 1962 amendments were framed. And you'll see a little bit of this as I go on. One of the first things that happened is the time that it took for a drug to get from the lab bench to the marketplace increased dramatically. Prior to the amendments, it only took about four years on average. Starting in the 1960s, that number increased until finally at the turn of the century, it was up to 14 years, an additional 10 years. Now, as you might imagine, if people have to wait 10 years more for life-saving drugs, some people are going to quite literally die waiting. And you know, that's what was happening with the AIDS epidemic. I was working at the Upjohn Company at the time. We were actually working on treatments for AIDS. And what was happening is the AIDS patients had figured out they couldn't wait for the FDA to approve these new drugs. So they hired black market chemists to make the very things we were working on in the pharmaceutical industry. Of course, this was in violation of patent law. It was in violation of FDA regulations, but they made them anyway, circulated them throughout the AIDS community and did a pretty good job because they, of course, kept track of some safety concerns and tried to make sure that people who were taking these drugs knew all about it. Now, if you watched the award-winning movie, Buyer's Dallas Club, you saw how the FDA actually went after some of these very sick people, especially in places like Texas, where the people who were running these buyer's clubs didn't really have a good connection with the media. In California, they did. So they left the ones in California alone because if you think about it, had the media reported that the FDA was persecuting and prosecuting sick people because they were trying to save their lives with unapproved drugs, uh, there would have been a big embarrassment for the FDA. So they, they ignored those people. But anyhow, you can kind of see what happens when people can't get access to drugs that are in development because of all this regulatory hoop jumping they risk going into the black market to get them. And this is still happening today. We have patients with ALS trying to manufacture these pharmaceuticals in their own kitchen, which is not an easy task. And, and actually, 
very difficult. So this is really a horrible thing to be happening. And because we know approximately how many people are saved by the drugs already on the market, we can do a quick calculation and get a feel for how many people have died waiting. The number is 15 million Americans. And of course, it's not just Americans that are dying because what happens in the US ripples out into the world. Almost half the drugs in the world are started in the US. So what happens here ripples out into the world. 15 million Americans are more Americans than have died in every war, including that one of our country's founding, the American Revolution. Sadly, I'm only beginning to tell you the sad story of how regulations kill. But we'll get into that in a little bit. Because first, before I tell you more bad news, I need to tell you what this delay has done to drug pricing and drug innovation. So let's talk first about the cost of getting an FDA approval. Basically, the cost of FDA approval is going up exponentially, even though, even though the time to market has plateaued out at about maybe 13 years due to some other tweaking of the law, the cost of getting the FDA approval is going up exponentially. Why is that? Well, you know, manufacturers cannot recover their costs these days unless they had a patent. It was different when I started in the industry. Upjohn was actually developing drugs. It didn't have patents. But with all these costly regulations, the only way a company can try to recover its cost is by having a patent. And so that has become something that a drug doesn't get developed without. So the patent window is narrow. It, it, the company only has a few years to recover their costs. So what they do is they have to shorten this timeline, which actually would keep increasing because the FDA is always putting in new more regulations. But instead, the companies do a very inefficient way of development. For example, the normal way they would do it is give single doses of their drug to animals, wait until they saw which, um, which dose was very toxic, and then they would do a multiple dose study at that toxic dose or a few less than toxic doses. But now they might start doing the multiple dosing at the same time as a single dose and just add more and more groups. Well, this is very costly, but it does shorten the timeline. So there are a lot of inefficient things that happen because of this. Now, as you might think, as a libertarian who knows some economics, if the cost of FDA approval keeps going up, and that is the biggest single cost in getting a drug to market, you would think that the cost of what we pay at the pharmacy, the price of new drugs, and now I'm talking about new drugs that are unique, not new drugs that are maybe an oral form of an intravenous drug, for example, or a different dose, but totally new drugs um, are going to be very costly. And if you track the cost of what we pay at the pharmacy for a new drug and plot it against the cost of getting FDA approval, you find it's a straight line. The cost of FDA approval is what is driving high pharmaceutical prices, not corporate greed. All corporations and stockholders are greedy. Why can the pharmaceutical companies continue to raise their prices until insurance can barely cover it? Well, the reason is they have to pass these costs on to consumers to stay in business. And even so, only two or three out of 10 drugs today recover their development costs. Two out of 10. Three out of 10. Basically, the whole industry is based on blockbuster drugs. This is very dangerous. Uh, you know, it means the industry 
is in a position where it could collapse very easily without these blockbusters. Now, if you look at all this data and you calculate what the cost of drugs at our pharmacy would have been if the trends that were apparent in the early 1960s had continued versus the trends of this exponential increase due to the 1962 amendments, what you find is that drugs would be about five to 10% in cost of what they are today. So if we went to the pharmacy and the drug was $100, we'd today only be paying five to $10 for that same drug. So you can see now why drug prices are high. But let's get back to this whole idea of how, how we have lost five to 10 years of our lives because of these regulations. Because, you know, we might, there may be some reason to think it might be worth paying for high costs if we had safer drugs. But in fact, we don't. <laughs> and you can see this very easily because prior to the amendments, the FDA would approve a drug and then some would be found to, to be unsafe and they would withdraw them from the market. And they withdrew about two and a half percent of the drugs. After the amendments, they're withdrawing about 3.3% higher. The promise of the amendments that fewer unsafe drugs would get to market, but if anything, more unsafe drugs are getting to market. In fact, some studies are saying that, you know, the fifth or even the third cause of disease or cause of death in the country today are due to properly prescribed pharmaceuticals. And we'll, you know, if we talk about the reasons for that, what we see is that there are reasons to think that drugs are less safe today. Um, and to kind of share that with you, the reason that is, not to get too technical, but again, you know, today's drugs require patents, which usually means they're not natural products. And that means that the body isn't used to seeing them. So it has to really gear up to take care of them. And today's drugs are primarily for years of use, maybe even lifetimes, a lifetime, because the only way that the manufacturers can recover costs is to have you take a lot of them. And as you see, even with that, they're still not recovering their costs. And then, of course, doctors having a bigger portfolio of drugs to prescribe are prescribing more drugs to people. And then these drugs interact in our bodies in ways sometimes we can't predict. And so that interaction often causes a problem. So we haven't gained any safety with these amendments. We've, we've had big costs, both in life and money, but I'm just getting started on the life part. I, I hate to tell you all this bad news, but we need to know it. We need to know what the situation is before we can fix it. So one of the other things that is causing us to lose years of our lives to these regulations are the loss of innovation. And we have lost at least 50% of our innovations. Why is this important? Well, if you think about it, <laughs> uh, the, the founder of the Rothschild dynasty died of a simple infection that penicillin would have cured, but because penicillin hadn't been discovered then, he couldn't take it, no matter how much money he had. And that's the thing. If you don't have innovation, then you can't buy a cure if it hasn't been invented, right? And I say at least a 50% loss because these are what we call late stage losses. They happen after the company has been developing the drug for many years and then realizes it's not going to make enough money on it and they drop it before the most expensive part comes. But we have a lot of loss of innovation even before development starts. And I'm going to tell you a personal story about that. When I was at Upjohn, the FDA called me up and said, oh, Dr. Ruart, we're so excited. You've just filed a patent for prostaglandins and liver disease. And we want to help you get this to market because there isn't anything for this kind of liver disease. And 100,000 people die every year. So we want to help you get this to market. 
well, <laughs> being young and naive, <laughs> I thought that would make a difference. But it truly didn't because the, the problem is when you find something that will treat a disease that no one else has been successful in treating, you need to know what dose to use. And even if you've done work in animals, you don't always know the dose in humans. In fact, you rarely do. You don't know how many times a day you have to give it. Uh, you don't know how many weeks or days or years you have to give it. And in the case of liver disease, it takes years to become a big problem. It might take years to reverse it. And if we didn't guess right on all of those things, the first time we did a human study, even if the drug was effective, it might not show the statistical significance that the FDA required. If that happened, we would have to start all over because we needed two US human studies to show statistical significance of 0 0.05. 0 0.1 wouldn't have been good enough. So when we made the calculation and looked at how long our patent life was on our prostaglandin, we quickly realized that unless we guessed right the first time, the prostaglandin would be off patent by the time we marketed it and we would not be able to recover our costs. Today, most drug companies make this calculation very carefully before they start development. So if we're losing half of our innovation in late stage development, when they made that calculation and thought they were okay, you can imagine that we've probably lost maybe closer to 80% of our innovations. But let's just assume for a moment we only lose 50%. And let's assume that those lost drugs are not even as effective as the ones we have on the market today. Let's say they're only 25% as effective. Then, if that's the case, about 27 million people have died since 1962 in this country because of loss of innovation. Another way of saying that is each of us have lost five years of our lives to the amendments. So where does the other 10 years come from? And where does the other five years come from? Because in the beginning I said it was five to 10 years of our lives we were losing. Well, interestingly enough, As I told you earlier, the change in medical practice and the change in the supplement industry that the amendments brought have inhibited our ability to understand what nutritional things might actually prevent disease. And I'll just give you a few examples to show you. You know, when I was working in the laboratory, this was way before you could genetically manipulate animals. So the way we wanted to look at animals was we wanted one with a disease, but they were healthy. We had titrated all their vitamins, minerals, all of their nutrients, and these rats were very healthy. So what could we do? Well, we knew a lot about nutrition and we knew if we took away one of their vitamins, depending on the disease we wanted to create, we could make them pretty sick. And that's exactly what we did. If you think about this for a moment, there's a big lesson to be learned here. Optimal nutrition keeps you healthy. And so the researchers all exercised, took vitamins, <laughs> kept their weight down, didn't smoke, didn't drink, uh, while the physicians in the company who weren't aware of what was going on in the research labs, at least not in that detail, uh, didn't have those practices. Uh, so the lesson is that nutrients are very, very important to our health. And that's why it's very detrimental when the FDA says that the vitamin manufacturers cannot advertise the health benefits of their vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients unless, unless they go through this 14-year development process. And the FDA, of course, blesses that program and approves the nutrient as a drug. 
well, these things generally don't have patents or the patent's gone if they ever had one. So of course, nobody can afford to do that. Uh, another little story from my Up John days, I was sitting in an airplane with one gentleman and he talked to me about these compounds we were developing, these drugs called Lazaroids. They were called Lazaroids because they seemed to do just about everything <laughs> to help people stay healthy. Uh, and at least in our animal studies, that's what our, our belief was, that it would help people stay healthy. Um, and we named it after Lazarus, <laughs> you know, the biblical person that Christ raised from the dead. He wanted to get some of these. So I asked the project manager, can we give him a compassionate use exemption and give him Lazaroids? And he said, uh, no, we can't do that right now, but just tell him to take a lot of vitamin E because it will do the same thing. Well, if vitamin E could do the same thing, why were we spending an average of two and a half billion dollars. That's today's number. Back then it was probably closer to 500 million. Why were we spending all this money developing Lazaroids? Well, the reason was, of course, that we couldn't have gotten our development costs back otherwise. One other story. So, and this one is not from my personal experience, but today, if you're on statins, you're probably taking coenzyme Q10, which is a natural substance that your body makes. And that's because when statins are detoxified by the body, it depletes the body of CoQ10, that's our abbreviation for it. And so you have side effects, but if you take CoQ10, those side effects generally don't come up. And we'll talk about that a little later too. Now, in the early 1980s, we knew that a B vitamin, folic acid, could prevent neural tube defects in babies. These are horrific defects. Most of the children are institutionalized if they don't die. Many are aborted because you could test for it in utero. But the FDA told the folic acid manufacturers if they even mentioned this in their advertising, that they would be prosecuted. Fast forward to 1992 and the Center for Disease Control started going, hey, women of childbearing age should be taking folic acid regularly. That way we can basically wipe out these neural tube defects. The FDA told the folic acid manufacturers if they even referred to the CDC's recommendation, they would be prosecuted. Meanwhile, in other countries, <laughs> The governments and the folic acid manufacturers were telling young women about this because you need the folic acid in the first month or two of pregnancy when you might not even know you're pregnant. And so consequently, they reduced the number of neural tube defects they had. And since if you take this, you take the right amount religiously, you can almost wipe these out entirely. This is a very big thing. The FDA decided, well, okay, we won't let the folic acid manufacturers tell young women about this, but what we'll do is we'll make all the grain manufacturers put folic acid in their products. And so they did. But of course, everybody eats differently, so some women weren't getting enough folic acid still, and there was very little impact of this regulation on the reduction of neural tube defects. So as a consequence, somewhere between 10 and 25,000 babies were needlessly born with these birth defects or were aborted. That's very sad. And I could go on, <laughs> but I'm not going to because time doesn't permit me to do that. You can learn more, of course, in my book, Death by Regulation, or you can ask me more questions later in the Q&A. So this is how the FDA has taken, in my opinion, another five years off our lives. It's very hard to calculate. There aren't studies about how, how many years of our life can be saved by nutrients, although one researcher estimated that doubling our vitamin D levels might increase our longevity two years. So I'm going to tentatively suggest that somewhere between the five years that we've lost by the delays in getting a drug to market and the loss of innovation, we probably have lost 
somewhere as much as another five years by losing this information on prevention. Very sad, very sad. So of course my recommendation, not surprisingly, would be to repeal the amendments, make FDA approval unnecessary for marketing, and turn the FDA, if we have to keep it, into a certifying agency. So they could put in their two cents, so to speak, and consumers could listen or not. And indeed, the Heartland Institute, another libertarian organization, has a less radical proposal that actually could get traction. It's called Free to Choose Medicine. And what it does is it says, okay, if if the drug has gone through the FDA required safety phase one testing and just one study where you're looking at some efficacy, but it's, it's not a full blown study like I was talking about for liver disease before, then a manufacturer could choose to go in the free to choose medicine track, which would never require FDA approval. They could at any point when they were satisfied with their studies, go ahead and sell their product. So you'd have a two-tier uh, development plan, and one of the requirements for free-to-choose medicine would be that manufacturers post their data. And not as radical as my idea, but <laughs> certainly one that I think I'm mentioning because it could get political traction, and I wanted you to be aware of it. So I want to get to the second part of my talk. If the FDA has shaved five to 10 years off our lives, what did it do in the coronavirus uh, situation? Well, <laughs> you can probably guess that it wasn't very helpful. We knew we were probably going to have a problem with coronavirus because other countries had. And other countries were making test kits that we could have bought. In fact, in mid-January, uh, one of the German companies shipped 250,000 kits to the World Health Organization. But in early February, our FDA said, nobody can import tests. The only test kit you can use in this country is the CDC, the Center for Disease Control Test. Well, if the test had worked, maybe the monopoly wouldn't have been so bad. But it turned out it didn't. It was contaminated. And I don't have the details of that contamination. They aren't getting out. But there seemed to be hints that the contamination might have been viral contamination, which could mean that the entire CDC facility is contaminated with virus, which would make anything else it did suspect. Again, I don't know the details, but just hearing about it is a little scary. So the FDA kept its um, ban on importation and ban on domestic production of test kits on for about six weeks. Finally, in mid-March, it relented and said, okay, we can import and we can have domestic manufacture. After it had really stymied the private sector for six weeks, some companies just said, we're not gonna be bothered. Others, of course, continued on figuring that they would eventually have a chance to sell their kits. So in mid-March, in the US, we had tested uh, one out of 4,300 Americans, where in South Korea, they were testing heavily, like one out of 17. And the only testing we had done in the United States since the CDC's kit was so bad were from hospitals who had imported the test kits before the ban happened. <laughs> and of course, they didn't like give them back or tell anybody, they just used them. So in mid-March, the FDA did a total reversal and said, okay, private companies, you can produce your test kit. You don't even have to send in your paperwork for two weeks. But of course, the problem with that is if the FDA didn't approve the paperwork, you could be in trouble. And that's exactly what happened to two or three uh, 
companies that sent out home test kits so people could do their nasal swab at home and send it in and find out if they had coronavirus. March 20th, the FDA made these companies recall thousands of home test kits. It must have cost them a small fortune. And of course, they couldn't even analyze the kits they got back. I mean, you know, when people sent them in because the FDA forbade it. By March 24th, Germany was shipping to the US, so it would have kits. But without these test kits in the early stages, we couldn't identify who was a carrier and who needed to be quarantined. And frankly, to a large extent, we still don't know that. Now, it wasn't just the test kits that the FDA made difficult to get. They restricted protective gear similarly. If you weren't already making protective gear in the United States, you could not just start up and sell it. And you couldn't import it either. So we had our healthcare workers who are exposed to the flu and coronavirus every day, having to reuse disposable gowns, disposable masks. I mean, this, you know, this put them at much greater risk. Also, hand sanitizers flew off the shelves, as most of you know. It was very hard to get for some time. Stepping up to the plate were the whiskey distillers. They said, hey, we know that hand sanitizers are generally made with isopropyl alcohol. But you know what? Ethanol works. Ethanol is drinking alcohol, of course. They said, ethanol works, we've got lots of ethanol, we'll make hand sanitizers. And the FDA said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Somebody might drink the hand sanitizers because it has drinking alcohol in it. So you can't make hand sanitizers unless you put a poison in there to prevent people from drinking it. The problem with that additive was that it would have contaminated the machinery of the distillers so they would not be able to ever use their machinery again. Naturally, they didn't like that too much. And many of them, I believe, <laughs> went ahead and produced ethanol-based hand sanitizers without the additive anyway. Eventually, of course, the FDA relented on the protective gear. I don't know that it ever relented on the hand sanitizers. Okay, so we couldn't test. We couldn't get protective gear. You might remember if you tried to get a mask or a gown or gloves, you, you might have run out. You might not have been able to get them as just a regular citizen, right? And certainly the healthcare provi uh, providers couldn't. So uh, you couldn't get hand sanitizer. So what was left? Social distancing was the only thing left. Basically, it was quarantining everybody instead of the people who were infected, which is traditionally how you prevent spread of disease. So social distancing basically required shutting down the economy. There were 20% unemployed in May, compared to just 3.5% in February. And a lot of those jobs will never come back. Why? Because small businesses, which create 60% of our jobs, are the hardest hit by these shutdowns. They don't have a big cash reserve like many uh, corporate, large corporate entities have. So what will happen is when social distancing ends, many people will find that they have no job to go back to. And evidence is starting to come about that social distancing doesn't do a whole lot. And I do have something I'll share in the chat box. So if you'd like to see some of this evidence, you can get started on it. But I am going to guess that after the coronavirus crisis passes, there's going to be a lot of people analyzing these things. And they're going to be pointing out that social distancing probably didn't do a whole lot. And you might ask, why is that? Well, it turns out that many of us, if not most of us, have already been exposed to coronavirus. There's been testing done now in different populations. And for example, in Italy, 43% of the people test positive. 
It doesn't mean they're infected. It means that they have the coronavirus perhaps in their nasal passage, for example. Now, this means if they were in a weakened state, they probably would have gotten infected. But obviously they've been exposed. And in those types of tests that they used, for the most part, they're tests that have a high rate of false negatives. This is because like when you do a nasal swab, you don't just stick that nasal swab into a machine and measure virus. What you have to do is grow up what's on that nasal swab. You know, make sure that it grows up so there's more of it and now you can detect it. So <laughs> in some cases, for whatever reason, we don't understand all the time uh, why, but you know, some viruses and bacteria just don't grow up when we try to culture them. So obviously if you can't grow them up, you're not going to detect them. So what this means is probably, it's, it's probably even conservative to say that half the people, more than half the people in Italy are carrying around coronavirus. And in the US, the numbers are a little smaller, but it, they're starting to show a similar pattern. Many more of us have been exposed than we ever dreamed of. So, and, and the thing is about half the people who test positive don't show any symptoms at all. So we have a lot of people walking around that have been exposed to coronavirus and either didn't get sick or even if they had the virus in their bloodstream, just didn't have much of a reaction to it in terms of getting symptoms for coronavirus flu. So that may be why social distancing isn't showing a really huge effect. Only time will tell. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that social distancing does absolutely nothing. Please be clear on this. We don't have all the data yet, but we're starting to get indications that it might not have been as effective as we thought. How about some good news? The good news is that because of this crisis, FDA actually loosened a lot of their restrictions. It used to be, for example, if you wanted to take the information that came off ventilated patients and hook your ventilator up to a Bluetooth device, you had to tell the FDA, they had to look at your paperwork, which took a while to put together and decide if that was okay. Well, they've said, no, we're not gonna do that. Telemedicine has been highly regulated and basically slowed by the FDA's ridiculous regulations. For example, doctors aren't supposed to be able to do telemedicine on their private cell phone. So if they want to do telemedicine, they have to carry their private cell phone. They have to carry the cell phone for telemedicine. Oh, this is just crazy. Also, I'm sure many of you are well aware that if your doctor resides in the state you live in, uh, but the prescription you need comes from out of state. It, it's tough getting that prescription filled <laughs> because doctors don't necessarily have prescribing privileges in other states if they're licensed in a different state. Those restrictions were dropped for the coronavirus crisis. And of course, the FDA is giving emergency approval to some antiviral drugs. So a lot of these restrictions that have been dropped and shown to really make things difficult in an emergency are likely to stay in place. Less regulations are a good thing. So now I want to kind of get into a part that I didn't tell you I was going to get into, but you may see very easily where I'm going with this. This crisis has given us as libertarians an opportunity in many ways. There are going to be areas in the world and here that are lobbying to make a coronavirus vaccine, vaccine mandatory. But, I mean, Denmark's already done it, even though we have no vaccine and may never have one. But there's a little problem. When coronavirus started, the government said, oh, be sure and get your flu shot so you can prevent this thing. Well, it turns out the flu shot actually predisposes people to coronavirus. Why? Well, if your body is busy making antibodies to whatever the seasonal flu is, it may not have enough oomph left, so to speak, enough energy left to make um, a good antibody to fight the coronavirus. 
Uh, we don't really understand this totally yet. Again, data is preliminary, but if the flu virus predisposes us to a more dangerous virus, I think there's going to be a lot of pushback for mandatory vaccines. And that's a good thing because, you know, having a mandatory vaccine really interferes with our health freedom. If the government can demand that we be injected with whatever it wants us to be injected with, well, we could be in big trouble. Now, because of all this and the problems with the FDA in this coronavirus crisis, I think people are going to have a lot less trust in government than they used to, at least if they know the story. And it's up to us to tell them. We need to get the word out. And I think people will, for the most part, make a very wise decision in taking responsibility for their health and trying to stimulate their immune system in a natural way maybe with supplements, uh, some that have been, you know, very effective in infectious situations like zinc, melatonin, iodine, you know, these things are being used to boost the immune system now by many people. In fact, there's some protocols out there that go into that. And there's going to be a number of studies that are going to come out after this crisis is over showing that there's a lot of deaths from unintended consequences. For example, in Italy, something like 25% uh, of the people who are having heart attacks at home are not going into the hospital. And since 90% of those people die, this means that we're going to have a lot more deaths than we would have otherwise from cardiac disease. And of course, a lot of there's been a lot of delays in things like cancer treatment. I have a brother-in-law who needed cancer treatment. His was put off for more than a month. Um, there's going to be deaths due to economic stressors with people losing their job, losing so many jobs in our economy that were not far from the numbers of unemployment that we had during the Great Depression. We can probably expect more suicides. And I think as these studies become apparent, we're going to see even more people that no longer trust government. So if we share the story of how the FDA not only creates death by regulation in normal times, but really prevented us from being able to test to see if we had coronavirus, have protective gear for our healthcare workers and ourselves, and really denied us hand sanitizers, uh, <laughs> except for the uh, bold uh, disregard of this regulation from our whiskey distillers. Um, you know, I think people are gonna change the way they look at the FDA and government in general. And of course, we should definitely be pointing to a lot of the self-care that, that can be possible. And there are a lot of people who understand that the FDA is not their friend. These are the people in alternative therapies or the supplement industry who are well aware that the FDA suppresses uh, some more natural ways of prevention. And these people are ripe for the libertarian message and we have not recruited them. And to kind of spur you on and show you that they are very ready, I'm showing you the picture of myself on the Life Extension magazine almost 20 years ago when I was trying to become the FDA commissioner. So I could privatize the FDA. I, I have it in quotes because it would be, it would basically be turning the FDA into a certifying agency. I was not only endorsed by Dr. Ron Paul, but Life Extension, obviously. And I don't know if you're aware of that, but the founders of Life Extension are libertarians. Remember I talked to you about CoQ10 earlier? Well, these are the people who brought CoQ10 into the United States, and these are the people who were prosecuted by the FDA because of it. Their attorneys said, hey, you can't fight the FDA. You're going to prison. Just negotiate with them and see if you can just get a you know, light sentence. And these founders said, no way. We're fighting them. And they did. They fought them for eight years and they won. It was the first really major victory that the supplement industry had had against the FDA.
I'm putting their uh, website, I'll put that in the chat room too, actually, it's easy, it's lifeextension.com. And I wanted to point out that if you're sitting there thinking, yeah, I want to know about these alternative things, where can I go kind of one-stop shopping to find out, I recommend lifeextension.com. The reason is they have a whole section of disease protocols where you can learn exactly how to, um, you know, exactly what's known, I guess I should say, about the use of supplements and drugs to help your situation. Because they handle drugs as well. And when I say handle, I mean report about their benefits or lack of benefits. So to guide you a little bit, it's probably the the best single site you can go to to learn about these things. And I want to point out that the people in the alternative medicine industry are activists. There's two times that Congress was asked by the FDA to let the FDA regulate supplements. Both times they were defeated because Congress got more mail from the alternative practitioners and supplement takers than any other issue they ever had mail on. These are the people who move in our movement. Yes, and just, just to wrap up here, we need them in our movement, not only because they're activists, but because they're already libertarians in this issue. It would be very easy for them, us to take them the full way. So I'll open it to questions if there are any, and uh, let me know if I can help out in any way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. I always learn so much from your discussions. It, I'm hoping that you can hear me okay. Um, give yes. me a little feedback. Okay, good, good. I have a litany of questions, but we have very, very limited time left. So I'm going to start with the most uh, important ones. Um, basically regarding, you know, the, the topic at hand today is Corona. First of all, how effective are masks? <laughs> Depends on your mask, I think. Um, I, I'm, I am giving my opinion because I do not have... I have not seen a study on this, so I just want you to know that up front. I think if you have a mask with a proper charge on it, you can it will it will prevent bad things from coming in. If it doesn't have the proper charge on it, then it won't. Now, what does I mean by charge? If, if you remember your microbiology labs, if any of you have them, you saw these flasks and they have cotton stoppers in them. Well, cotton lets, lets air in and out, right? What stops the bacteria from getting in? It's the charge on the cotton. So I think there are certain masks that can protect you as well as other people if you have coronavirus. So a bandana is not doing anything. Again, it would depend on the charge, and I'm not sure they're all created equal. And I don't have any easy way to test it, or I'd tell you. All right. I'll, okay. So um, I guess the other stuff is basically how do they get off reporting all these deaths as corona when they are not actually coronavirus deaths? Like, yes, <laughs> I can tell you that. So the government is paying hospitals. Uh, I think it's $13,000 for every death where coronavirus is put on the death certificate. So doctors are being pressured to put coronavirus on the death certificate if they think the person might have died from coronavirus or if the person tested positive for coronavirus but died of a complication of pre-existing conditions. Uh, and if they're on a ventilator, they're getting, I think it's, uh, um, I'm not sure I'm remembering this number exactly right. It's in the 30,000s. I think it's 30, 39. Oh, 39. You may be right because I, I, I'm, I'm realizing I don't remember the exact number. <laughs> I remember thinking, wow, you know, that's more than some people make a year. And well, yes, but the ventilator can be dangerous to coronavirus patients. This is not the same kind of lung damage that you see in pneumonia. So actually now the protocol is not to put them on a ventilator unless you absolutely have to. One thing that is crazy is how fast everything has been changing through the coronavirus pandemic. You know, one day they're saying, yeah, these, yeah, these test kits are fine. Then they're banning them. Then they're, you know, it's amazing how quickly that they can work when things, when they need to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Mary. Well, it has been a joy. Thank you so much for all of your information and for joining us here at the very first Taxation of Stuff Fest. I'm going to go ahead and um, let you go and we'll get wrapped up here, ready for our next guest. Let's okay. see. We've got Justin Armin coming on next.
Great. And I'll just, you know, if anyone wants, has more questions they think about afterwards, just go to my website at ruart.com, R-U-W-A-R-T.com. Go to the About tab. You'll find a way to contact me. And I ask you to do it that way because I get special flags less likely to go in spam. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Mary. Oh, you're welcome. And thanks for what you're doing here. And thanks Absolutely. for all your business.